Namaste, group hug. Please come and join me on the sofa. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Samantha Woodham, and she is a family law barrister and also the founder of The Divorce Surgery. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. No, great pleasure, great pleasure. So can you tell us a little bit about The Divorce Surgery? Uh, you're still working at Four Paper Buildings, but this is a new venture for you. Yeah, that's right. So I have been a family law barrister for about 15 years at Four Paper Buildings, advising one spouse or another on divorce in relation to either their financial arrangements or their children's arrangements. And about six years ago, I was approached by a couple who didn't want to go to separate legal advisors. They wanted one lawyer to advise them both together about what a court would view as fair in their circumstances. And I assumed that because solicitors can't advise couples together, that barristers would be in the same boat. But it turns out when I inquired with the Bar Standards Board and the Bar Council who regulate barristers, that barristers can advise couples together. And um, I read into it a lot and realized that actually in other European countries, this is the default, that when couples split up, they start off with one lawyer together. And only if their case is complex, do they go off to separate lawyers. And as soon as I realized that it was available elsewhere and I thought about you know, all my experiences of adversarial litigation and what I'd want for my friends and my family for myself, I thought I need to make this available. And so that's why with fellow barrister, Harry Gates, we set up about four years ago, the divorce surgery. Um, and that exists solely to enable those couples that are suitable to get legal advice together to share a lawyer on divorce. And I manage that alongside my private practice. Amazing, so congratulations. And is this part of a new movement of barristers going direct to the client rather than having to go through lawyers and then go to the barrister? Yeah, so it's a, it's a combination of things really. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it must be at least 10 years ago that direct access came in. And that is the process by which members of the public can go direct to barristers and instruct them. Before that, they always had to go through solicitors. So we were always a referral profession that changed. And so this builds on that, but goes a lot further because it's now offering a service which has never been available before, which is the ability of a separating couple to share a lawyer um, and share a barrister. Yeah, amazing. I mean, it sounds like a good idea and it's something that a lot of people would want to take up, I think. So tell us, um, you, you recently won a Power Women Award with us, so congratulations. Um, tell us what that means to you, winning an award um, for your life and for the surgery. It's amazing. I, I, it's so amazing. I mean, you know, I, I don't think lawyers are natural risk takers. And um, when I decided to go for this and, you know, I brought Harry on board, it was a, a huge risk and a massive punt as well. And a lot of, you know, my mates, my friends in the legal profession had said, look, you know, Sam, this is really naive. You know, couples want the conflict. They're not gonna go for this option. Um, and it was going against the grain of all of the precedent that, that we have. Um, so it's super pleasing that the business has worked and that couples want the service, but then to be individually recognized is wonderful. And with an award that makes me sound like a superhero has just given me a lot of credibility with my kids. You know, <laughs> I kind of said, you know, no more messing at bedtime, I'm a power woman now. <laughs> Um, amazingly, a lot of women do repeat that to their children. We have heard this. Um, so tell us about your leadership style and how, how are you finding it being a woman in business? It's interesting. Um, I'm really enjoying being in business, actually. I'm enjoying all the new challenges and all the things I'm learning. I think probably my um, leadership style, if I have one, has very much been informed by my experience of working so far. So I started off at Freshfields in a kind of corporate law firm as a solicitor. I then moved over to the bar. Um, and I, I really like people to enjoy work um, and to feel that they can work flexibly. And I think when you make people feel confident and feel appreciated, you get their best. Um, so I'm very, very supportive of flexible working. I think we've got a real problem within the legal profession generally about retaining talent. And I think one of the issues with that is that we have this kind of culture of presenteeism, which inhibits people from combining work with family life or with other pursuits. 
And so I, I really am trying with the divorce surgery because I've started it from scratch. You know, I have that flexibility of kind of saying, OK, well, let's get people in here who don't want to work full time, who, you know, want to do their go and get their hair cut in the middle of the day and then catch up later. That's fine. I, I don't mind how people order their lives as long as the work gets done and gets done well. Um, that's all that matters to me. Yeah, and hopefully with the pandemic, things will change wholesale across many of the industries, but it's a great way to work, so congratulations. So are you a disruptor, would you say, for the legal industry? Yes, I think I am. <laughs> and it surprises me to say that, because I'm, I'm not a super disruptive kind of personality so far, but yeah, I think this has been hugely disruptive. And But it's been disruptive in a way that was completely required and what's really encouraging and exciting now is that we have kind of you know social media presences and I'm looking at Twitter and LinkedIn a lot more in a way I never did before but a lot of people are talking about one couple one lawyer you know is this the future of family law is this something we need to make more available and it's really exciting to think that they wouldn't have been having that discussion if we hadn't come along. Amazing and so the the recent law change which we heard a lot about uh, over the last year was the no fault divorce and I always felt like that didn't really have a lot of impact with child and financial arrangements but what are you seeing from your perspective and your lens? So I completely agree um, it's really the tip of the iceberg it's it's a great start you know if you can start down the track of not having to write something horrid in a divorce petition that's completely irrelevant for the rest of the proceedings then that's great and I think the fact that couples can now choose to petition for divorce together is much more reflective of the way we view divorce in modern society you know it's a, it's a choice that the relationship has run its course and that's okay the difficulty is what I see in practice is the areas where people most fall out are around the division of their finances and arrangements for their children. And we still, when it comes to those parts, very much have a kind of default adversarial model. Um, there was some research done recently about, you know, every couple that separates in England and Wales with children, about 38% of those end up in court around the arrangements for their children. And it just shows how normal it is to end up in court about those sorts of issues when really we need to get to a point where court is reserved for those really complex, really difficult cases and the norm is not to end up there. And for one of the things we heard during the pandemic, which um, may or may not be a thing, is that financial settlements were being, there was like a do over. People were saying, I've lost money, I've lost money with my investments, I can no longer pay the same amount. Is that still an issue? And in a way, are settlements done in, in with enough flexibility or are they done properly in your view? It, because it caused such a stir up in the last year. It's absolutely vital when you're sorting out your long-term financial arrangements division of your finances that you get good legal advice. I mean, I'm conscious that I would say that because I'm a lawyer, but there are such huge repercussions long-term in terms of financial security. What's happened with COVID is it really depends on the circumstances. So where you've got a situation, for instance, where you've got a business, which has either gone completely bananas because of the pandemic well but is unsustainably well um, or is doing very badly say in the leisure industry but could be something that, that will bounce back quickly it's been very very difficult to value businesses and in those situations it's much better to, to wait until you've got a good value or think of a different structure to the settlement whereby either a lump sum is deferred or you know one of the spouses takes an interest in the business that then we'll obviously bounce back as the business bounce back. Um, but there are other cases where actually the, the pandemic hasn't prevented settlements because the part of the order that is unclear is variable. So maintenance, for instance, is always variable. Um, and so you deal with the situation that you have on the ground in front of you, but as and when incomes revert, um, maintenance can be varied and you can certainly build into agreements, disclosure obligations, such that you know when somebody's income is, is improving. Um, I mean, what I'd say generally about divorce is that transparency is key. Um, and if you have a couple who are both being open and transparent about their finances and willing to provide ongoing disclosure where that's necessary and willing to explain what 
their financial view is properly, then you're, you're very likely to be able to reach a deal. The issue is if you have someone who's trying to take advantage of a particular blip um, to say, oh, my business is worth nothing, for instance, um, so it should be taken off the balance sheet, then that's unhelpful and that just leads to litigation. Do you think, uh, just finishing off on that, but do you think the pandemic will change how people look at financial settlements in the future or it, it will all just stay the same and this is just a very odd blip that is not really going to have a massive impact on settlements in the future? I think it's actually having a big impact on how people view divorce. I think that there was a change coming already where there was just less appetite for contested litigation for extremely expensive proceedings. And I think almost the pandemic in lots of areas of our lives actually, but has given us a much needed perspective on what really matters. And I think increasingly couples during the pandemic who have decided that their relationship has run its course, they just think, look, we just need to navigate this. Yes, we need some legal advice, but it needs to be done proportionately. And they just don't have the appetite for conflict for conflict's sake um, in the way that possibly, you know, when we think of the sort of War of the Roses, 1980s kind of movie dramatizations of divorce, that's very much what was more prevalent. And I cannot quite get to the bottom of this. I've asked a few family lawyers, is divorce on the rise because of the pandemic or is it static? You can see stats that say both things. Um, and mm. I think actually it's too early to know because divorce is something, it's a huge decision. It's a big life change. And it's normally the product of many months, if not years of deliberation. Um, and we're still in the pandemic now. And so knowing if the pandemic has, you know, some people will say it's caused marriages to, to reconnect. Um, some people say it's put additional strain on marriages, caused them to fail. I just don't think we know yet um, because we won't be seeing that data for probably another 12 to 18 months. So maybe still stuck in the system. So what kind of things should people be thinking about if, if they are in the next couple of years planning on divorcing? What, what would you say to them to get their uh, thoughts in order? So I think the most important thing to think about, first of all, is just the mindset. I think we have such an association of divorce and failure. You know, we, we, we stigmatise divorce because of, sort of centuries, because of Henry VIII, probably. Um, but it's ridiculous. It, it, it's a life change. It's a transition. It's emotional. Um, but it shouldn't be stigmatized and it shouldn't be viewed as a failure. It was funny. I've been trying to read different things, you know, during the pandemic. And I read The Hundred Year Life. And it talked about how, you know, we're all living for a really long time now. And we're going to have to transition in terms of careers, transition in terms of relationships. And that's completely fine. And you can have a really successful relationship or marriage that lasts 15, 20 years, and then you both change and it's time to move on to something else. But that doesn't mean that everything that went before was a mistake. It doesn't mean that you haven't had some wonderful memories and you haven't grown as a person. You're now just ready for your next adventure. And, and I just think if we start off in a place as much as we can, of not feeling guilty and not feeling like a failure um, and encouraging our support network to buoy us up rather than bring us down. And, and, and by saying that, what I mean is, you know, if you find out a friend of yours is splitting up, I think you instinctively go into protective mode of wanting to look after them and sort of almost vilify the other person. And that's not helping your friend. What we need to do is be buoying them up for sure, but also enabling them to maintain a civilized relationship with the ex. Um, and you know, the sooner that we can move on to look at divorce in that way is, is a life change rather than as some terrible event, then for 42% of marriages that end in divorce, it'll be a lot less traumatic um, to get through. I agree, uh, for sure. And I had this uh, peculiar dream the other day where I was gonna live in, until I was 150. So good luck to me. Um, so. How much does a divorce cost with you? Is it a different cost to doing it separately? Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's a fraction of the cost of what uh, the sort of traditional two solicitor route is. Um, and, and that's for two reasons, really. The first is that we're seeing um, the couple together at the same time. So it's much more efficient. 
And the second is that we're really streamlined. So when Harry and I set this up, we thought, okay, we want to be the opposite, right? We want to be the opposite of what's available. So what don't we like about the current system? We've got a blank sheet of paper. What are we going to do? So we didn't like conflict. So, you know, we see couples together. We didn't like open-ended hourly rates. So we only offer fixed fee. So, and we didn't like the delay. So the average divorce takes about 14 months. Our process takes about six to eight weeks. So essentially what we do at the very beginning is that we'll sit down with a couple separately, make sure they're suitable, but also be working out, okay, how complex is this case? How long is the financial disclosure exercise gonna take? What's the seniority of the barrister they're gonna to need to advise them? And we use all of that information to come up with a fixed fee, which we then stick to. So they know before they start what the process, how much the process is going to cost. And we get them to a point within those kind of eight weeks of knowing what a very senior barrister thinks a judge would do in their situation. And they then, then have a written advice to go off with. They can get a second opinion if they want to. But the idea is from as early as we can to put them in a position where they can negotiate constructively and settle. Um, because they know what fair looks like in their situation. And I think that's a really good point, isn't it? Because drawn on lengthy divorces does seem to take its toll emotionally on people. So finishing off, can, I, can you give me some thoughts? What should children think about in divorce? Because often divorce happens to them, doesn't it? So what would you say to children who are going through this experience and probably quite worried about their parents divorcing? So children need to be much more central to everything we think about divorce. And there's been a lot of research recently about that, about how can we remove this from being a fight between two adults into actually what is right, this particular child or these particular children. Um, one of the things that we've done at the divorce surgery in our co-parenting service is bring in a co-parenting expert. Because I think what's vital, I'm a lawyer, you know, I am not a child therapist, but I think what's vital is when you think about children you think about the conversations that parents have with that child about the relationship breakdown that it's done in the right way and that they engage as early as possible with professionals experienced in that child therapists co-parenting experts who can help them have those conversations with their children and and really try and make the divorce not dominate their their childhood you know because it shouldn't um, and so from the get-go we're saying to parents okay before you even get legal advice with us. Let's get you some co-parenting expertise so that you know the right things to say to your child. You know the way that your child's gonna be thinking about this. Um, there's an, an amazing organization called the Family Youth Justice Board um, that I saw do a presentation recently. And that's all young people. So between the ages, I think of 10 and 25, who've been in court proceedings themselves. You know, their parents got divorced, they ended up in court. And the things that they say about how they felt the process was harmful to them. And, you know, there've been reports now done by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory saying that, you know, court proceedings cause children emotional harm. And the more that we can do from the very beginning of, as you say, put yourself in the position of the child, what do you want to create for your child? You know, the more likely we are to, to get to a better outcome. So I can't answer that question because I don't feel qualified to give that sort of answer, but we always engage clients with getting that sort of therapeutic help because I really feel quite strongly that there is a real limit to what lawyers do you know we should stick within our tram lines and give the legal advice but we absolutely need for our clients to be accessing the right additional support um, both in relation to co-parenting therapeutic emotional support for them as grown-ups too going through this um, and also financial support so they're getting the right financial expertise um, that they need to support them through it. Well, considering you said you thought you couldn't answer that question, I think you did a pretty good job. So I just want to say thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Thank you for the update. Congratulations on the award. And hopefully we'll catch up with you in person later this year. That would be lovely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Samantha Woodham of the Divorce Surgery for her update on family law. Please join us to see the session on either Tuesday or Friday at 11.30.